welcome to the Brief History Podcast. My name's Andrew Knight, I'm your host. Today's episode is on the Spanish-American War. As always, thank you for everybody who has rated, reached out, spoken to us, reviewed or even shared, liked and retweeted on social media about any of the previous episodes. Thank you for the reviews we've had so far. Reviews like from Pod Fanboy, love the pod, learn about walls I've never heard of before and certainly do some research myself. It goes on further or she goes on further. Uh, but once again, thank you for anybody who has reviewed. Uh, thank you, Nate and GA, for reaching out regarding the sound. This podcast is new, it is work in pro- progress. We will try to work on the sound. I will try to initiate and uh, not mumble in future. That is entirely my fault. Thank you for pointing that out. And uh, please get in touch further on down the line because hopefully we'll be able to uh, to do something about that and make it better. Uh, and we'd like to uh, to get your thoughts carrying on throughout the, uh, the series. So thank you once again. Um, if you haven't already reviewed or re- reached out to us, please do. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram at Brief History Podcast. We're on Twitter at B History Podcast. Please speak to us. We love speaking to you. Thank you once again. The Spanish-American War was fought between the United States and Spain in 1898. Hostilities began in the aftermath of the external explosion of the USSS Maine in Havana Harbor in Cuba, leading to the US intervention in the Cuban War of Independence. American acquisition of Spain's specific possessions led to its involvement in the Philippine Revolution and ultimately in the Philippine-American War. The main issue was Cuban independence. Revolts had been occurring for some years in Cuba against Spanish rule. The US later backed these revolts upon entering the Spanish-American War. There had been war scars before as in Virginia's affair in 1873, but in the late 1890s, US public opinion was agitated by anti-Spanish propaganda led by newspaper publishers such as Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, which used yellow journalism to call for the war. The business community across the United States had just recovered from a deep depression and feared that war would reverse the gains. It lobbied vigorously against the war. The United States Navy armoured cruiser Maine had mistressly sunk in Havana Harbour. Political pressures from the Democratic Party pushed the administration of Republican President William McKinley into a war that he wished to avoid. President McKinley signed a joint congressional resolution demanding Spanish withdrawal and authorising the president to use military force to help Cuba gain independence on April 20th, 1898. In response, Spain severed diplomatic relations with the United States on April 21st. On the same day, the US Navy began a blockade of Cuba. On April 23rd, Spain stated that it would declare war if the US forces invaded its territory. On April 25th, Congress declared a state of war between the US and Spain that de facto existed since April 21st, the day the blockade of Cuba had begun. The United States sent an ultimatum to Spain demanding it surrender control of Cuba But due to Spain not replying soon enough, the United States assumed Spain had ignored the ultimatum and continued to occupy Cuba. The Ten-Week War was fought in both the Caribbean and the Pacific. As the American agitators for war well knew, US naval power proved decisive, allowing expeditionary forces to disembark in Cuba against the Spanish garrison already facing nationwide Cuban insurgent attacks and further wasted by yellow fever. America, Cuban and Philippine forces obtained the surrender of Santiago de Cuba 
and Melilla, despite the good performance of some Spanish infantry units in fierce fighting for positions such as San Juan Hill. Madrid sued for peace after two obsolete Spanish squadrons sank in Santiago de Cuba and Melilla Bay and a third, more modern fleet was recalled home to protect the Spanish coasts. The result was the 1898 Treaty of Paris, negotiated on terms favourable to the US, which allowed its temporary control of Cuba and ceded ownership of Puerto Rico, Guam and the Philippine Islands. The concession of Philippines involved payment of $20 million to Spain by the US to cover infrastructure owned by Spain. The defeat and loss of the last remnants of Spanish Empire was a profound shock to Spain's national psyche and provoked a thorough and artistic re-evaluation of Spanish society known as Generation of 98. The United States gained several island possessions spanning the globe and a rancorous new debate over the wisdom it expands citizenism. It was only five US wars against a total of 11 sovereign states that have been formally declared by the US Congress. The combined problems arising from Peninsular War 1807 to 1814, the loss of most of its colonies in the Americas in the early 19th century Spanish-American Wars of Independence and three Carlist Wars 1832 to 1876 marked the low point of Spanish colonialism. Liberal Spanish elites like Antonio Canavas de Castillo and Emilio Castellar offered new interpretations of the concept of empire to dovetail with Spain's emerging nationalism. Canavas made clear in an address to the University of Madrid in 1882 his view of the Spanish nation as based on shared cultural and linguistic elements on both sides of the Atlantic that tied Spain's territories together. Canavas saw Spanish imperialism as markedly different in its methods and purposes of colonization for those in rival empires like the British or French. Spaniards regarded the spreading of civilization and Christianity as Spain's major objective and contribution to the New World. The concept of cultural unity bestowed special significance on Cuba which had been Spanish for almost 400 years and was viewed as an integral part of the Spanish nation. The focus of preserving the empire would have negative consequences for Spain's national pride in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. In 1823, American fifth president, James Monroe, 1758 to 1831, served 1817 to 1825, declared the Monroe Doctrine, which stated that the United States would not tolerate further efforts by European governments to retake, expand their colonial holdings in Americas, or to interfere with the newly independent states in their hemisphere. At the same time, the doctrine stated that the US would respect the status as existing European colonies. Before the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, Southern interests attempted to have the United States purchase Cuba and convert it into a new slave territory. The Ostend Manifesto proposal of 1854 failed and national attention shifted to the growing sectorial conflict and threat of civil war. After the American Civil War and Cuba's Ten Years' War, US businessmen began monopolizing the devalued sugar markets in Cuba. In 1894, 90% of Cuba's total exports went to the United States, which has provided 40% of Cuba's imports. Cuba's total exports to the US were almost 12 times larger than the exports to her mother country, Spain. US business interests indicated that while Spain still held political authority over Cuba, economic authority in Cuba, acting authority was shifted to the United States. The US became interested in trans 
isthmus canal access across Central America, either in Nicaragua or in Panama, where the Panama Canal would later be built, 1903 to 1914, and realised the need for naval protection. Captain Alfred Thayer Mahon was an especially influential theorist. His ideas was much admired by future 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, as the US rapidly built a powerful naval fleet of steel warships in the 1880s and 90s. Roosevelt served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897-98 and was an aggressive supporter of an American war with Spain over Cuban interests. Meanwhile, the Cuba Libre movement, led by Cuban intellectual Jose Marti, had established offices in Florida and New York to buy and smuggle weapons. It mounted a large propaganda campaign to generate sympathy that would lead to official pressure on Spain. President churches and de democratic farmers were supportive, but business interests called on Washington to ignore them. Although Cuba attracted American attention, little note was made of the Philippines, Guam or Puerto Rico. Historians noted there was little popular demand in the United States for an overseas colonial empire, though at this time the long-time colonial empires of the United Kingdom with its British Empire, quote, on which the sun never set, in quote, and France's French Empire maintained theirs with their some added growths and additions, now joined by the German Empire, Italian Empire and Empire of Japan. These new and growing empires were dramatically expanding their overseas holding during the late 19th century in unclaimed areas among native and indigenous people in the less developed continents of Africa, Asia and the Pacific. The first serious bid for Cuban independence, the Ten Years' War, erupted in 1868 and was subdued by the authorities a decade later. Neither the fighting nor reforms in the Pact of Saint-Jean, February 78, quelled the desire of some revolutionaries for wider autonomy and ultimately independence. One such revolutionary, Jose Marti, continued to promote Cuban financial and political autonomy in exile. In early 1895, after a year of organising, Martini launched a three-pronged invasion of the island. The plan called for one group from Santiago Domingo, led by Maximo Gomez, one group from Costa Rica, led by Antonio Macao Grales, and another from the United States, preemptively thwarted by the US officials in Florida, to land in different places on the island and provoke an uprising. While their calls for revolution, the Di Grito de Berry, was successful, the result was not the grand show of force Marti had expected. With a quick victory effectively lost, the revolutionaries settled in to fight a protracted guerrilla campaign. Antonio Convalas del Castillo, the architect of Spain's restoration constitution and the prime minister at the time, ordered General Arsenio Martinez Campos, a distinguished veteran of the war against the previous uprising in Cuba, to quell the revolt. Campos's reluctance to accept his new assignment as a method of containing a revolt to the province of or Oratín earned him criticism in the Spanish press. The mountain pressure forced Canavas to replace General Campos with General Valerino Weller, a soldier who had experience in quelling rebellions in overseas provinces and the Spanish metropole. Mela deprived the insurgencies of weaponry, supplies and assistance by ordering the residents of some Cuban districts to move reconcentration areas near the military headquarters. This strategy was effective in slowing the spread of rebellion. In the United States, this fueled the fire of anti-Spanish propaganda. In a political speech, President William McKinley used this to ram Spanish actions against armed rebels, 
He even said this, quote, was not civilized warfare, end quote, but not, quote, extermination, end quote. The Spanish government regarded Cuba as a province of Spain rather than a colony and depended on it for prestige and trade as a training ground for the army. Spanish Prime Minister Antonio Canovas de Castillo announced, quote, The Spanish nation is disposed to sacrifice the last peseta of its treasure and to the last drop of blood of last Spaniard before consenting that anyone snatch it, even one piece of its territory, end quote. He had long dominated and stabilised Spanish politics. He was assassinated in 1897 by Italian Antichrist Michel Angelino, leaving a Spanish political system which was not stable and could not risk a blow to its prestige. The eruption of the Cuban revolt, whalers, measures and that popular fury these events whipped up proved to be a boon to the newspaper industry in New York City where Joseph Pulitzer of the New World, York World and William Randolph Hearst of the New York Journal recognised the potential for great headlines and stories that would sell copies. Both papers denounced Spain but had little influence outside New York. American opinion generally saw Spain as a hopelessly backward power that was unable to deal fairly with Cuba. American Catholics were divided before the war began but supported it enthusiastically once it started. The US had important economic interests that were being harmed by the prolonged conflict and deepening uncertainty about the future of Cuba. Shipping firms that had relied heavily on trade with Cuba now suffered losses as the conflict continued unresolved. These firms pressed Congress and McKinley to seek an end to the revolt. Other American business concerns, specifically those who invested in Cuba sugar, looked to the Spanish to restore order. Stability, not rule, was the goal of both interests. How stability would be achieved would depend largely on the ability of Spain and the US to work out their issues diplomatically. While tensions increased among the Cubans and Spanish government, popular support of intervention began to spring up in the United States due to the emergence of the Cuban Libra movement and the fact that many Americans had drawn parallels between the American Revolution and the Cuban Revolt. Seeing the Spanish government as tyrannical colonial oppressors. Historian Luis Perez notes that, quote, the proposition of war in behalf of Cuban independence took hold immediately and held on thereafter. Such was the intense sense of the public mood. End quote. At the time, many poems and songs were written in the United States to express support of the Cuban Libra movement. At the same time, many African Americans facing growing racial discrimination and increasingly retardation of civil liberties and rights wanted to take part in the war because they saw it as a way to advance the cause of equality, service to the country, hopefully helping and gain political and public respect amongst the wider population. President McKinley, well aware of the political complexity surrounding the conflict, wanted to end the revolt peacefully. In accordance with this policy, McKinley began to negotiate with the Spanish government, hoping that the negotiations would be able to end the yellow journalism in the United States and therefore end the loudest calls to the war with Spain. An attempt was made to negotiate a peace before McKinley took office. However, the Spanish refused to take part in the negotiations. In 1897, McKinley appointed Stuart L. Woodford as the new minister to Spain, who again offered to negotiate a peace. In October 1897, the Spanish government still refused the United States offer to negotiate between the Spanish and the Cubans, but promised the US it would give the Cubans more autonomy.
However, with the election of a more liberal Spanish government in November, Spain began to change their policies in Cuba. First, the new Spanish government told the United States that it was willing to offer a change in reconcentration policies, the main set of policies that was feeding yellow journalism in the United States, if the Cuban rebels agreed to a cessation of hostilities. This time the rebels refused the terms in hopes a continued conflict would lead to US intervention and the creation of an independent Cuba. The Liberal Spanish government also recalled the Spanish Governor General Weyla from Cuba. This action alarmed many Cubans loyal to Spain. The Cubans loyal to Weyla began planning large demonstrations to take place when the next Governor General Ramon Blanco arrived in Cuba. US Consul Fitzhugh Lee learned of these plans and sent a request to the US State Department to send a US warship to Cuba. This request led to the USS Maine being sent to Cuba. While the Maine was docked in Havana, an explosion sank the ship. The sinking of the Maine was blamed on the Spanish and made the possibility of negotiation peace very slim. Throughout the negotiation process, the major European powers, especially Britain, France and Russia, generally supported the American position and urged Spain to give in. Spain repeatedly promised specific reforms that would pacify Cuba but failed to deliver. American patience ran out. McKinley sent the US main to Havana to ensure the safety of American citizens and interests and to underscore the urgent need to reform. Naval forces were moved in position to attack simultaneously on several fronts if the war was not avoided. As Maine left Florida, a large part of the North Atlantic Squadron was moved to Key West and to the Gulf of Mexico. Others was also moved just off the shore of Lisbon and still others were moved to Hong Kong. At 9.40 on the evening of February the 15th, 1898, Maine sank in Havana Harbour after suffering a massive explosion. While McKinley urged patience and did not declare that Spain had called the explosion, the deaths of 250 out of 350 soldiers on board focused American attention. McKinley asked Congress to appropriate 50 million for the defence and Congress unanimously obliged. Most American leaders took the position that the cause of the explosion was unknown but public attention was now riveted on the situation and Spain could not find a diplomatic solution to avoid war. Spain appealed to the European powers, most of whom advised it to accept US conditions for Cuba in order to avoid war. Germany urged a united Europe stand against the United States but took no action. The US Navy's investigation made public on March 28 concluded that the ship's powder magazine was ignited when an external explosion was set off under the ship's hull. This report poured fuel on popular indignation and in the US making the war inevitable. Spain's investigation came to the opposite conclusion. The explosion originated within the ship. Other investigations in later years came to various contradictory conclusions but had no bearing on the coming of war. In 1974, Admiral Hyman George Rickover had his staff look at the documents and decided there was an external explosion. A study commissioned by the National Geographic magazine in 1999 using the AME computer modelling stated that the explosion could have been caused by a mine but no definitive evidence was found. After the main was destroyed, New York City newspapers, publishers Hearst and Pulitzer decided that the Spanish were to blame and they publicised this theory as a fact in their newspapers. They both sensationalised and astonishing accounts of atrocities committed by Spanish in Cuba by using the headlines in their newspapers such as Spanish murderers and remember the main. Their press exaggerated what was happening and how the Spanish were treating the Cuban prisoners. 
The stories were based on factual accounts, but most of the time the articles were published were embellished and written with incendiary language causing emotional and often heated responses among readers. A common myth for fleet states that when illustrator Frederick Remington said there were no war brewing in Cuba, Hearst responded, quote, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war, end quote. This new yellow journalism was, however, uncommon outside of New York City, and historians no longer consider it a major force shaping the national mood. Public opinion nationwide did demand immediate action, overwhelmingly the efforts of President McKinley, Speaker of the House Thomas Brackett Reed, and business community to find a negotiated solution. Wall Street Big business, high finance and main street businesses across the country were vocally opposed to war and demanded peace. After years of severe depression, the economic outlook for the domestic economy was suddenly bright again in 1897. However, the uncertainties of warfare posed a serious threat to full economic recovery. Quote, war would impede the march of prosperity and put the country back many years End quote, warned the New Jersey Trade Review. The re- leading railroad magazine editorialised, quote, from a commercial and mercenary standpoint, it seemed peculiar bitter that this war should come when the country had already suffered so much and so needed rest and peace, end quote. McKinley paid close attention to the strong anti-war consensus of business community and strengthened his resolve to fall diplomacy and negotiation rather than group force to end the Spanish tyranny in Cuba. A speech delivered by Republican Senator Redford Proctor of Vermont on March 17, 1898 thoroughly analysed the situation and greatly strengthened the pro-war cause. Proctor concluded that war was the only answer. Many in the business and religious communities, which had until then opposed war, switched sides, leaving McKinley and Speaker Reed almost alone in their resistance to war. On April the 11th, McKinley ended his resistance and asked Congress for authority to send American troops to Cuba to end the civil war there, knowing that Congress would force a war. On April the 19th, while Congress was considering joint resolutions supporting Cuba independence, Republican Senator Henry M. Teller of Colorado proposed the Teller Amendment to ensure the U.S. would not establish permanent control over Cuba after the war. The amendment, disclaiming any intention to annex Cuba, passed the Senate 42 to 35. The House concurred the same day, 311 to 6. The amended resolution demanded Spanish withdrawal and authorised the president to use as much military force as thought necessary to help Cuba gain independence from Spain. McKinley signed a joint resolution on April 20, 1898 and the ultimatum was sent to Spain. In response, Spain severed diplomatic relations with the US states in April 21st. On the same day, the US Navy began a blockade of Cuba. Spain stated it would declare war if the US forces invaded its territory on April 23rd. On April 25th, the US Congress declared a state of war between the US and Spain had de facto existed since April 21st, the day the blockade of Cuba had begun. The Navy was ready but the army was not well prepared for war and made radical changes in plans and quickly purchased supplies. In the spring of 1898, the strength of the regular US army was just 25,000 men. The army wanted 50,000 new men, but received over 220,000 through volunteers and the mobilization of state national guard units, even gaining nearly 100,000 men on the first night after the explosion of the USS Maine. The Department of State of the United States of America summarized the aftermath of the war for the Filipino people. Quote, After its defeat in the Spanish-American War of 1898, Spain ceded its long-standing colony of the Philippines in the United States in the Treaty of Paris.
On February the 4th, 1899, just two days before the US Senate ratified the treaty, fighting broke out between American forces and Filipino nationalists led by Emilia Alamando, who sought independence rather than changing colonial rulers. The insurer Philippine American War lasted three years and resulted in the death of over 4,200 American and over 20,000 Filipino combatants. As many as 200,000 Filipino civilians died from violence, famine and disease." End quote. In 1901, novelist Mark Twain wrote about the aftermath of the War of the Philippines. Quote, we have robbed a trusting friend of his land and his liberty. We have invited clean young men to shoulder a discredited musket and to do bandits work under a flag which bandits have been accustomed to fear not to follow. We have debauched American honour and blackened her face before the war. In his war empire, Professor Paul Atwood of the University of Massachusetts writes, Quote, the Spanish-American War was fomented on outright lies and trumped up accusations against the intended enemy. War fever in general population never reached a critical temperature until the accidental sinking of the USS Maine was deliberately and falsely attributed to Spanish villainy. In a cryptic message, Senator Lodge wrote that Quote, there may be an explosion any day in Cuba which would settle a great many things. We have a battleship in the harbour of Havana, our ship, which outmarches anything the Spanish have in mass as dry to gay gas. End quote. In the 333 years of Spanish rule, the Philippines developed from a small overseas colony governed from the vice royalty of New Spain to a land with modern elements in the cities. The Spanish-speaking middle classes of the 19th century were mostly educated liberal ideas coming from Europe. Among these illustrados was the Filipino national hero, Josie Rizal, who demanded larger reforms from the Spanish authorities. This movement eventually led to the Filipino revolution against Spanish colonial rule. The revolution had been in a state of truce since the signing of the Pact of Biak Nabato in 1897, with revolutionary leaders having accepted exile outside of the country. On April 23, 1898, a document appeared in the Melina Gazette newspaper warning of pending war and calling for Filipinos to participate on the Spanish side. The first battle between American and Spanish forces was at Manila Bay, where on May the 1st, Commodore George Dewey, commander of the U.S. Navy's Asiatic Squadron aboard USS Olympia, in a matter of hours defeated a Spanish squadron under Admiral Patricio Montejogo. Dewey managed this with only nine wounded. With the German seizure at Tsingtao in 1897, Dewey's squadron had become only the naval force in the Far East without a local base of its own and was beset with coal and ammunition problems. Despite these problems, the Asiatic squadron not only destroyed the Spanish fleet but also captured the harbour of Manila. Following Dewey's victory, Manila Bay was filled with warships of Britain, Germany, France and Japan. The German fleet of eight ships ostensibly in Philippine waters to protect German interests, acted provocatively, cutting in front of American ships, refusing to salute the United States flag according to customs of naval courtesy, taking surround soundings of the harbour and landing supplies for the besieged Spanish. The Germans, were, with interests of their own, were eager to take advantage of whatever opportunities the conflict in the islands might afford. There was a fear at the time that the islands would become a German possession. The Americans called the bluff of the Germans, threatening conflict if the aggression continued and the Germans backed down. At the time, the Germans expected the confrontation in the Philippines to end in an American defeat, with the revolutionaries capturing Manila and leaving the Filipinos right for German picking. Commodore Dewey transported Emilio 
a Guidardo, a Filipino leader who led rebellion against Spanish rule in the Philippines in 1896 from exile in Hong Kong to the Philippines to rally more Filipinos against the Spanish colonial government. By June the 9th, Aguilardo's forces controlled the provinces Bolaca, Calavat, Lagunda, Batangas, Batan, Zambules, Pombanga, Pangasian, Mindero, and had laid siege to Manila. On June the 12th, Angelado proclaimed the independence of the Philippines. On August the 5th, on instructions from Spain, Governor General Basila Augustine turned over command of the Philippines to his deputy, Vermin Jagonez. On August the 13th, with American commanders unaware that a ceasefire had been signed between Spain and the US on the previous day in Washington, D.C., American forces captured the city of Melilla from the Spanish in the Battle of Melilla. This battle marked the end of Filipino-American collaboration as the American action of preventing Filipino forces from entering the captured city of Melilla was deeply resented by the Filipinos. This later led to the Philippine-American War, which would prove to be more deadly and costly than the Spanish-American War. The US has sent forces of some 11,000 ground troops to the Philippines. On August the 14th, 1899, Spanish Captain General Jandernes formally capitulated and US General Merritt formally accepted the surrender and declared the establishment of a US military government in occupation. That same day, the Sherman Commission recommended that the US retain control of the Philippines, possibly granted independence in the future. On December 10, 1898, the Spanish government ceded the Philippines to the United States in the Treaty of Paris. Armed conflict broke out between the US forces and the Filipinos when US troops began to take the place of the Spanish in control of the country after the end of the war resulting in the Filipino-American War. On the 20th of June, a US fleet commanded by Captain Henry Glass consisting of the protected cruiser US Charleston and three transports carrying troops to the Philippines entered Guam's Apra Harbour. Captain Glass, having opened sealed orders, instructed him to proceed to Guam and capture it. Charleston fired a few cannon rounds at Fort Santa Cruz without receiving return fire. Two local officials, not knowing that war had been declared and believing the fire had been a salute, came up to Charleston to apologise for their inability to return the salute as they were out of gunpowder. Glass informed them that the US and Spain were at war. The following day, Glass sent Lieutenant William Rosalentuta to meet Spanish governor to arrange the surrender of the island and the Spanish garrison there. Some 54 Spanish jet infantry were captured and transported to the Philippines as prisoners of war. No US forces were left on Guam, with the only US citizen on the island, Frank Portash, told Captain Glass he would be looking at things until US forces returned. Theodore Roosevelt activated intervention in Cuba, both for the Cuban people and to promote Monroe Doctrine. While Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he placed the Navy on a wartime footing and prepared Dewey's Asiatic Squadron for battle. He also worked with Leonard Wood in convincing the Army to raise an all-volunteer regiment, the 1st US Voluntary Cavalry. Wood was given command of the regiment that quickly became known as the Rough Riders. The Americans planned to capture the city of Santiago de Cuba so to destroy Linier's army and Cavera's fleet. To reach Santiago, they had to pass through concentrated Spanish defences in the San Juan Hills and a small town in El Cani. The American forces were aided in Cuba by the pro-independent rebels led by General Calixo Garcia. For quite some time, the Cuban public believed the United States government to possibly hold the key to its independence and even annexation was considered for a time. While historian Luis Perez explored in his book Cuba and the United States ties of a singular intimacy. The Cubans harboured a great deal of discontent towards the Spanish government 
due to years of manipulation on this part of the Spanish. The prospect of getting United States involvement in the fight was considered by many Americans and Cubans as a step in the right direction. While the Cubans were weary of United States intentions, the overwhelming support from the American public provided Cubans with some peace of mind because they believed the United States were committed to helping them achieve their independence. However, the, with the imposition of the Platt Amendment of 1903 after the war, as well as economic and military manipulation on part of the United States, Cuban settlement towards the United States became polarised, with many Cubans disappointed with continuing American influence. From June 22nd to the 24th, the 50th Army under General William R. Shafter landed at Dakari and Sibony, east of Santiago, and established an American base of operations. A contingent of Spanish troops, having fought a skirmish with Americans near Sibony on June 23rd, had retired to their likely entrenched positions at Las Guasimas. Advanced guard of US forces under former Confederate General Joseph Wheeler ignored Cuban scouting parties and orders to proceed with caution. They caught up with and engaged a Spanish rear guard of about 2,000 soldiers led by General Atterio Ruben, who effectively ambushed them in the Battle of Las Guimaras on June the 24th. The battle ended indecisively in favour of the Spanish and the Spanish left Las Guaramas on their planned retreat to Santiago. The US Army employed Civil War era skirmishes at the head of the advancing columns. Three of the four US Army soldiers who had volunteered to act as skirmishers were walking point at the head of the American column were killed, including Hamilton Fish II, grandson of Hamilton Fish, the Secretary of State under Ulysses S. Grant, and Captain Aileen K. Crampon Jr., who Theodore Roosevelt would describe as one of the finest natural leaders and soldiers he ever met. Only Oklahoma Territory Pawnee Indian Tom Isbell, wounded seven times, survived. The Battle of Las Legumas showed the US that quickly thinking American soldiers would not stick to linear tactics, which did not work effectively against Spanish troops who had learned the art of cover and concealment from their own struggle with Cuban insurgents and never made the error of revealing their positions while on the defence. Americans advanced by rushes and stayed in the weeds so that they too were largely invisible to the Spaniards who used untargeted volley fire to try to mass fires against their advancing Americans. While some troops were hit, this technique was mostly a waste of bullets as the Americans learned to duck as soon as they heard the Spanish word fire, Vigo, yelled by the Spanish soldiers. Spanish troops were equipped with smokeless powder arms that also helped to hide their positions while firing. Regular Spanish troops were mostly armed with modern charger loaded 7mm 1893 Spanish Mauser rifles and using smokeless powder. The high speed 7 by 57mm Mauser round was termed the Spanish Hornet by the Americans because of the supersonic crack as it passed overhead. Other irregular troops were armed with Remington rolling block rifles in .43 Spanish using smokeless powder and brass jacketed bullets. On July the 1st, a combined force of about 15,000 American troops in regular infantry and cavalry regiments, including all four of Army's quote, coloured, end quote, regiments and volunteer regiments, among them Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, the 1st, 71st New York, the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry and the 1st North Carolina and rebel Cuban forces attacked 1,270 entrenched Spaniards in dangerous Civil War style a frontal assault at a battle Al Caney in the Battle of San Juan Hill outside of Santiago. More than 200 US soldiers were killed and close to 1,200 wounded in the fighting thanks to a high rate of fire from the Spanish put down range by the Americans. Supporting fire by Gatlin guns were critical to the success of the assault.
Caveira decided to escape Santiago two days later. First Lieutenant John S. Pershing, nicknamed Black Jack, oversaw the 10th Cavalry Unit during the war. Pershing and his unit fought in the Battle of San Juan Hill. Pershing was cited for his gallantry during the battle. The Spanish forces at Guantanamo were so isolated by Marines and Cuban forces that they did know, not know that Santiago was under siege and their forces in the northern part of the province could, could not break through Cuban lines. This was not true as Iscara relief column from Manzanino, which fought its way past can determine Cuban resistance but arrived too late to participate in the siege. After the battles of San Juan Hill and El Caney, the American advance halted. Spanish troops successfully defended Fort Canusa, allowing them to stabilise their line and bar the entry to Santiago. The Americans and Cubans forcibly began a bloody, strangling siege of the city. During the night, Cuban troops dug successive series of trenches toward the Spanish positions. Once completed, these parapets were occupied by the US soldiers and a new set of excavations went forward. American troops, while suffering daily losses from Spanish fire, suffered far more casualties from heat exhaustion and mosquito-borne disease. At the western approaches to the city, Cuban General Calixo Garcia began to encroach on the city, causing much panic and fear and reprisals among the Spanish forces. US forces were then made to withdraw. Yellow fever had quickly spread amongst the American occupation force crippling it. A group of concerned officers of the American Army chose Theodore Roosevelt to draft a request to Ronald Washington that he withdraw the army, a request that parried a similar one from General Shafter, who described his force as an army of convalescents. By the time of his letter, 75% of the force in Cuba was unfit for service. On August the 7th, the American forces started to leave Cuba. The evacuation was not total. The US Army kept the Black Knight US Cavalry Regiment in Cuba to support the occupation. The logic was their race and the fact that many black volunteers came from southern states would protect them from disease. This logic led these soldiers to be nicknamed immune. Still, the knight left 73 of his 94 soldiers had contracted the disease. In May 1898, in Puerto Rico, Lieutenant Henry J. Whitney of the United States 4th Artillery was sent on a reconnaissance mission sponsored by the Army's Bureau of Military Intelligence. He provided maps and information on the Spanish military forces to the US government before the invasion. The American offensive began on May 12. 1898 when a squadron of 12 US ships commanded by Rear Admiral William T. Sampson of the United States Navy attacked the Archpedalo's capital San Juan. Though the damage inflicted on the city was minimal, the Americans established a blockade in the city's harbour, San Juan Bay. On June 22, the cruiser Isabel II destroyed a terror with delivered a Spanish counterattack, but were unable to break the blockade and the terror was damaged. The land offensive began on June 25th when 1300 infantry soldiers led by Nelson A. Mills disembarked off the coast of Guanica. The first organised armed opposition occurred in Yaku, in what became known as the Battle of Yaku. This encounter was followed by the Battle of Fajardo. The United States keys control of Fajago on August 1st but were forced to withdraw on the August 5th after a group of 200 Puerto Rican Spanish soldiers led by Pedro de Pino gained control of the city while most civilian inhabitants fled to a nearby lighthouse. The Americans encountered larger opposition during the Battle of Guayama and they advanced towards the main island's interior. They engaged in crossfire at Guanimi River Bridge, Gameo, Silver Heights and finally a battle as a Manti. The battles were inconclusive as the Allied soldiers retreated. In the Battle of San Germain concluded in a similar fashion with the Spanish retreating to Lares. On August 9, 1898, American troops were 
pursuing units retreating from Kamea encountered heavy resistance in Abianti in a mountain known as Kero Gavasa da Amazanti and retreated after six of their soldiers were injured. They returned three days later, reinforced with artillery units and attempted a surprise attack. In the subsequent crossfire, confused soldiers reported seeing Spanish reinforcements nearby and five American officers were gravely injured, which prompted a retreat order. All military actions in Puerto Rico were suspended on August the 13th after US President William McKinley and French Ambassador Jules Cambon acting on behalf of the Spanish government signed an armistice whereby Spain relinquished its sovereignty of Puerto Rico. With defeats in Cuba and the Philippines and both its fleets destroyed, Spain sued for peace and negotiations were opened to, between the two parties. After sickness and death of the British consul Edward Henry Rawson Walker, American Admiral George Dewey requested the Belgian consul to Manila, Edouard André, to take Rawson Walker's place as an intermediary with the Spanish government. Hostilities were halted on August 12, 1898, with the signing in Washington of the Protocol of Peace between the United States and Spain. After two months of difficult negotiations, the formal treaty and the Treaty of Paris were signed on December 10, 1898, and was ratified by the United States Senate on February 6, 1899. The United States gained Spanish colonies of the Philippines, Guam and Puerto Rico in the treaty and Cuba became a US protectorate. The treaty came into force in Cuba in April 11, 1899, with Cubans participating only as observers. Having been occupied since July 17, 1898 and thus under the jurisdiction of the United States military government, Cuba formed its own civil government and gained independence on May 20, 1902, with the announcement of the end of jurisdiction of the island. However, the US imposed various restrictions on the new government, including prohibiting alliances with other countries and observed their right to interfere. The US also established a perpetual lease on Guantanamo Bay. The war lasted 10 weeks and John Hay, the United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom, writing from London to his close friend Theodore Roosevelt, declared it had been, quote, a splendid little war. The press showed Northerners and Southerners, blacks and whites fighting against a common foe, helping to ease the scars left by the American Civil War. Exemplary of this was the fact that four former Confederate State Army generals had served in the war now in the US Army and all of them get only in similar ranks. These officers included Matthew Butler, Fitzhugh Lee, Thomas L, Thomas L, Rosler and Joseph Wheeler, though only the latter were seen in action. Still an existing movement during the Battle of Guamaras, Wheeler apparently forgot for a moment which boys fight him, having supposedly called out, quote, let's go boys, we've got the damn Yankees on the run, end quote. The war marked American entry into the war world affair. Since then, the US government has had a significant hand in various conflicts around the world and entered many treaties and agreements. The Panic of 1893 was over by this point and the US entered a long prosperous period of economic and population growth and technical innovations that lasted through to the 1920s. The war redefined national identity served as a solution of sorts to the social division plaguing the American mind and provided a model for all future news reporting. Once again, thank you for listening to the Brief History Podcast. I've been your host, Andrew Knight. Please like, share, retweet and follow us on all our social media. We're at Twitter at Brief B History Podcast. We're on Facebook and Instagram too, Brief History Podcast. Please give us a five-star review. It really does help. Uh, a small act like that will really help this new podcast. Uh, please be in touch. As I said, uh, it really does uh, help us understand how this podcast is working. Um, 
like we discussed earlier we've talked about the uh, the noise um, and the the sound qualities we're trying to improve that and hopefully i've uh, spoken a lot better please be in touch and we can only get better if you do so um, please rate us on itunes we're on all the major podcasts um, listening devices uh, find us there tell your friends tell your family please help us out it really will help massively thank you and goodbye